Good evening, and welcome to this live online discussion to launch the intriguing new book, The Next Pope, The Leading Cardinal Candidates, by Edward Penton, and published by Sophia Institute Press. My name is Diane Montagna, and I'll be hosting tonight's program, coming to you live from this stunning rooftop terrace in Rome. In fact, just a stone's throw away from the Sistine Chapel, where conclaves are held. Taking, taking part in this evening's live discussion is an array of distinguished guests. First of all, of course, is the author, author of this new book, the journalist Edward Penton, who has spent many years covering the Vatican for a number of publications, including Newsweek and Newsmax, and is now the Rome correspondent for the National Catholic Register. Also here on the terrace with us is John Allen, the well-known Vatican analyst, founding president of Crux Media, and author of many books on the Catholic Church, including on the topic of conclaves and papal candidates. We're also honored to have with us Professor, Professor Roberto De Mattei, the respected Italian church historian, who's the author of many highly regarded works on the church and the popes. He's also the founder of the Italian Catholic website, Correspondenza Romana. And last, but certainly not least, joining us from across the pond via television link is the acclaimed New York Times columnist, Ross Douthat, who wrote the well-received 2018 book, To Change the Church, Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism. So let's dive right into our discussion, and then we'll take a qu few questions from the viewers. Um, Edward, perhaps you could open up our discussion by telling us a little bit about the genesis and about the content of the book. Sure, Dan. Well, this book uh, goes back a number of years. In fact, uh, it began without me, but, and I came to it rather later on in it. Um, but it's, it was really a collaborative effort. It was, w it was originally started by a small group, and they, they saw a need for sort of equipping the cardinals, the College of Cardinals particularly, mm -hmm to know about uh, the cardinals who could be elected pope because there's been uh, talk over the years that often the cardinals don't know each other they don't know anything about each other often and in fact i heard the other day that one of the cardinals at the last conclave said that there was a lot of confusion at the last conclave about the who to vote for and their basic hmm. uh, information about them so this is really to equip them for that and also for the faithful, I think everyone is always quite interested in who could be Pope and that this really is to aims to give them a, a good in-depth knowledge about who they are, the, the qualities they have, whether they have, for example, uh, they have a reputation for holiness or for teaching or whatever. So it really it does do that and it, uh, as I say, it's, it gives the faithful that all round knowledge and also allows them to know who to pray for because mm -hmm. if they want they might not want to know who to pray for during during the conclave um, so we hope very much that this book is it can be a service to the church can be a service to the cardinals um, when a conclave comes and as I s uh, the content of the book is really based on these 19 cardinals who we thought um, have a good chance of being elected Pope so um, these are profiles their of profiles, each of the profiles of each of the cardinals they begin with uh, a biography a uh, short biography detailing their service to the church. Then you go through the, the three offices of the, of the bishop and examining their, these offices in detail. So the, the, the sanctifying office of the bishop, mm -hmm. the governing office and the teaching office. Um, and so it really goes into depth in that and, and with footnotes as well and, and re referencing all the documentation that's been out there about them. So it's all there in one place mm -hmm. for, for readers to, to uh, to access and also there's an introduction which goes through the origins of the College of Cardinals that goes back to uh, the Old Testament even um, and then the, the, the roles of the Cardinals today uh, the modern day role uh, it goes into the details of how a Pope is elected and all the mm. mechanics of that and it also has the papal qualities the qualities needed for a Pope so in that sense it's going to be I think uh, a helpful reference point for when a conclave does come mm -hmm. and you'll have all of that together. Mm -hmm. It's very much in a way um, an encyclopedic reference uh, manual if you like for, mm -hmm. for, for the faithful and for the cardinals. Mm -hmm. I think many people might be asking why you're publishing this book now when we already have a Pope and Pope Francis so why now? Sure well it really goes to the point that uh, conclaves are often announced and it's a very short notice between when they're announced and when the actual conclave happens mm -hmm. and there's very very little time in which to get to grips with who might be pope so we want to sort of preempt that because of course we don't know when a conclave is going to happen mm -hmm. and so this is really so that we can be prepared we know exactly who they are um, 
and it doesn't have any bearing on this present pontificate or any, any past pontificate. Um, but I should point out that uh, um, a friend told me that uh, Peter Hebblethwaite, a former uh, correspondent of Vatican Easter for the tablet, uh, he did a similar project uh, during John Paul II's pontificate huh. and actually John Paul II outlived him by 10 years. <laughs> so it, it doesn't have a good, uh, a good record, but uh, hopefully I'll, uh, I'll live to see the day of the conclave. Yes. Good. Well, you've all received and seen advanced copies of the book. Um, John, maybe you could, we could begin by talking about your general impressions of the book and what you think it's going to contribute to the church. Sure. Well, let me begin by utterly laying waste to my reputation here tonight <laughs> and confess openly in, in a live broadcast medium that I'm actually a friend of Edward Penn. Uh, so I, I can't pretend to strict objectivity. <clears throat> I'm, I like it, and therefore I'm inclined to like his work. Now, that's that's not to say I'm not prepared to be critical. We'll see how the evening unfolds. But <laughs> okay. I've got my own personal list of your 19 picks that I find, frankly, totally preposterous, <laughs> and, and we can we can hash all of that out. Um, but two basic reactions. One, Diane, picking up on the on the question you just asked, Edward. Many moons ago, lost in the mists of prehistory, I also did a book about the next pope mm -hmm. under John Paul II. It was called simply Conclave. Uh, and it had sketches of 20 cardinals at that stage that I thought could be elected pope. Now, I heard reactions at that time, and Edward, it would surprise me if you're not hearing some of this now, mm. that it is disrespectful mm -hmm. to the sitting pope to speculate about his successor while he is still alive, um, that it is disloyal, uh, and that it can even be construed as an act of political sabotage, that you're trying to undercut him, style him as a lame duck, uh, and frankly, my answer to that question then, as it is tonight, is just rubbish. That, that's just frankly false. Mm -hmm. um, all of us here, I'm sure, have spent time over the years talking to cardinals who have participated in a papal election. To a man, they will all tell you they were conscious that it was the single most important thing they were ever going to do in their lives. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the Pope matters. Uh, and the last thing mm -hmm. you want the cardinals to be is uninformed when they have mm -hmm. to make that monumental choice. Um, so, Edward, I don't think you have to say you hope this is a service to the church. I can declare dogmatically <laughs> <laughs> that this is a service to the church. Good, good, good. Now, the second point, uh, second reaction, I guess, is this. Um, I, I presume the logic for me being here uh, is that I am the least identifiably strongly conservative figure on this panel. Um, and so I guess it is incumbent upon me to say, uh, having read the book, it clearly does reflect a kind of conservative view of things. I, I think, a, you know, I mean, at parts, frankly, I thought I was reading a CPAC briefing book uh, about the College of Cardinals. But uh, having said that, let me just say this. Um, what I have always admired about Edward, and I think it shines through in a particularly effective way in this book, is that he has a point of view like all of us do, fine. But I will say this, I have never read Edward Penton without learning something that I didn't already know. And so my, my pitch about this book would be, don't think it's only for a conservative audience. It's not. Uh, it may reflect a conservative point of view at some turns, but mm -hmm. you will, no matter where you come from, you will learn a great deal you didn't already know. I mean, just to give you a trivial example, but uh, it, it captured my imagination. When I was reading your uh, your chapter on Cardinal Zuppi at Bologna, mm -hmm. I have to confess, I did not know that the Archdiocese of Bologna owns an automatic gate company <laughs> business. <laughs> yes. uh, this was a revelation uh, to me, and so I started looking up this company. Money, and, yeah. Yeah, there's gotta be a metaphor in there about Francis's vision of a Chiesa in Ushita, right? So, <laughs> I haven't worked it Opening out yet, up but doors and yeah, I, I know there's something promising there if yeah. I spend enough time thinking about it. <laughs> uh, but but my point is, every one of these chapters. I mean, I have covered these cardinals most of my adult life. I I, I like to think I know a great deal about them. Mm. I came away educated, edified, knowing more. Um, do I share your analysis at every turn? Can I see the conservative filter there? Sure, uh, but then I can see anybody's filter. Mm. The test for me is not where somebody is coming from ideologically, it's how well do they know their turf, and you, Edward, you know your turf. Thank you, John. Well yeah. done. Ross, your thoughts on the book? 
Well, so I would first, I would second um, what John said. I think that it's a book, it's written with a manifest point of view um, of sort of where the lines of orthodoxy and heresy lie and what's best for the future of the church. But in certain ways, that makes it arguably all the more useful for someone who disagrees with Edward um, to read. And, you know, I, I think you could imagine the book very profitably read by an extremely progressive Catholic as a guidebook to, you know, their preferred candidates for the conclave. They just have to rearrange a few sentences here and there in their mind as they go. Um, so that's, that's the first point. The other thing I'd say more generally is that um, this is obviously in line with, um, as both John and Edward said, previous books by previous authors sort of reflecting on um, future potential conclaves. But there are also two things that have changed um, in the church, one over the last 50 to 75 years and one just over the last 10 that makes this project distinctive. The first is just the globalization of the church, the fact that papal elections have gone from being something carried out primarily by a, you know, a very European and very Italian body of cardinals, um, all of whom, or not all of whom, but many of whom know each other very well, who are sort of steeped in the internal politics of each other's roles as, mm -hmm. as bishops and cardinals and archbishops, to being something that now, even more so under Pope Francis with his cardinal appointments, um, an election that sort of involves a completely far-flung church with cardinals from all over the world, many of whom you know, aren't in Rome all the time, uh, many of whom don't know each other. Um, and in that sense, I think the role of the journalist, the sort of faithful Catholic observer, takes on a particularly, a, a sort of stronger importance in certain ways than it might have in 1940 or 1840. There, I think the cardinals probably know each other less than would have been the case in the past. And then the other change, obviously, is the fact that we now have a Pope Emeritus and the fact that the last Pope before uh, Pope Francis, Pope Benedict, resigned. And that, too, creates, I think, a different, a different atmosphere where it's not just that you're waiting for um, the possibility of God calling the Holy Father home. You're also waiting for a possible decision point um, from the current Pope, the current Pontiff, about when they're going to resign. And I think that, too, changes the landscape for a book like this, but also in certain ways makes it more relevant and important than, again, maybe it would have been even 20 years ago. Professor De Mate, what were your impressions of the, of the book? The first merit of uh, this book, in my view, is that it reminds us that there will be a next pope, and it is not a paradox, uh, because the person of Pope Francis has um, obscured uh, the institution he represents uh, and the debate between uh, conservative and uh, progressives, uh, which in the years uh, during the Second Vatican Council and uh, in the post-Council era was an ideological debate, a debate of uh, ideas, today, uh, today has been reduced to a, a debate between the uh, friends and enemies of Pope Francis. And many of uh, Pope Francis' uh, supposed uh, friends have an eschatological vision and uh, see uh, in him as uh, not uh, the successor of Peter, but uh, the successor of Jesus, uh, a kind of uh, Jesus the second. And, uh, and if it is so, there will be no next Pope, of course. But uh, this eschatological vision characterizes, uh, characterizes uh, also some of uh, the uh, enemies of Pope Francis uh, who consider him not Jesus II but the Antichrist. And uh, if uh, Pope Francis if is the Antichrist, after him will not be no, no other Pope because we know that uh, after the Antichrist there will be the return of Christ uh, and, the, and the parousia. And so, uh, for me, Pope Francis is neither uh, the Antichrist and neither Jesus II. It is more simply a dead Pope. And uh, for me, as uh, for many others, uh, it is very important uh, to know who will be the next Pope after, uh, after uh, Pope Francis. And uh, the merit of um, Edward Penton's uh, book is not only uh, 
that it is, that is a high value journalistic investigation, but also that introduces us uh, into the post Francis uh, uh, era, the era of the next Pope. Um, Edward, J John picked up on something. Um, some viewers might see that it's in, they might think that it's in bad taste to be publishing this book mm. while Pope Francis is still alive. How would you respond to them? Yes, well, it's just to, to explain, this is actually sort of a common idea. There are actually three projects, similar projects like this going on at the moment. Uh, there is this Red Hat report, but mm -hmm. that's a very different uh, project. Which is a which different is project. A different project and a different goals. Um, but we, we didn't see this really as sort of problematic or against mm. the church's tradition. And in fact, um, if you go back, and this is in what we, I put in the introduction, if you go back to the 1550s, mm -hmm. even the Middle Ages, um, there were things were called libelli, where uh, there were lists of, of prospective cardinal candidates which were put up in Rome, and they were like the precursors to newspapers. But because they were kind of unreliable, um, and they were sort of like, uh, you know, uh, I suppose we'd have to sort of like the bookies now, and they just sort of putting up lists of who they think <coughs> might be Pope. Um, then people actually turned to diplomats and trusted scribes, trusted writers, to actually put together um, proper, uh, reliable biographies of these cardinal candidates. Mm -hmm. And so, in a sense, this tradition goes back a long way. You could say it goes back to the Middle Ages. And it's no, as I said earlier, it has no bearing on the present pontificate, but it does, uh, in a way, it, the aim is really to prepare uh, the church prepare uh, the cardinals and the faithful really for a conclave that could happen. Mm -hmm. So it's, as I say, it, it has a long tradition. So it isn't it isn't really in bad taste. So I can I can see how it might seem mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. Professor De Matteo is a historian. Is there anything that you'd like to add on that point of the the fittingness or the the unfittingness of publishing this kind of book profiles on potential uh, future popes while while a, a reigning pope is still alive? It isn't. It is not uh, the first uh, uh, t time in history that uh, profiles of uh, popes are not perhaps uh, published uh, as a book, but uh, diffused among uh, the, the, the cardinals. Mm -hmm. It is a long tradition uh, du during the history of the church mm -hmm. uh, to know uh, once uh, above all uh, with um, 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 grace or through the uh, representative of the different uh, government uh, in Rome, uh, the ambassadors, uh, the, the diplomats, uh, they always have prepared uh, uh, short biographies of all the uh, papabili. Mm. And so I think that uh, the, the book of Edward Painting, it is in uh, this, uh, exactly in this line. Mm -hmm. Um, let's move to another topic, um, and that's what the impact of Pope Francis and his pontificate could be on the next conclave. Um, now, of course, Pope Francis has um, created numerous cardinals, but also, you know, could the current crisis in the church, whether it's the, the loss of vocations, that of course would be more here in Europe, the abuse crisis, financial scandals, or what some would see as a crisis of faith, how could that have an impact on the on the next conclave? And if so, what kind of compact, um, impact might that have? Ross, you've written a, a book tackling this very issue. What's your take on it? Well, so I think the conventional wisdom, which obviously those of you in Rome have a better handle on than I do, but I, I think the conventional wisdom is that the Francis pontificate has been such an era of a sort of papal activity intense media coverage of the pa of the papacy um, and sort of particular pushes for reform or change driven by the Holy Father himself that there may be a desire um, among the cardinal electors in the next conflict conclave to sort of take the temperature down a bit um, and to in, in effect elect someone who may carry forward certain aspects of Francis's agenda or, or his ministry um, but will be sort of present himself as less of a sort of charismatic leader for the church and a little bit more of a retiring figure or a sort of functional figure. Mm -hmm. That would be the conventional wisdom. I think that was sort of a stronger argument maybe two or three years ago um, when the arguments about Amoris Laetitia and communion for the divorced and remarried were at their hottest at the time, I guess, I was writing, writing my own book. I think in the last couple of years, 
we've already had a little bit of a cooling of those tensions um, where, you know, the Holy Father hasn't pushed as hard on certain issues, um, um, uh, a married priest and so on, than a lot of both conservatives and progressives ex expected. And then we've also had this moment in the Western world and really the whole world um, over the last few months with the coronavirus that's going to have tremendous repercussions, I think, for the church going forward. It's going to probably at least temporarily accelerate the decline of the institutional church in the West and probably therefore accelerate some of the shifts in Catholic power and influence around the world. Obviously, it throws into uncertainty the Vatican's relationship with China as China sort of deals with the virus and takes a more aggressive stance around the world. So I think this is a much, it, in certain ways, it's a calmer moment in the church and a more fraught moment in the world than it was two years ago. Um, and that might arguably push the cardinal electors to look anew for, for dynamism in, in certain ways and worry less about the dangers of, you know, too much dynamism, which might have been the big worry um, a couple of years ago. But mm -hmm. that, that's pure speculation. I'm curious what others think. John, your thoughts? <clears throat> well, and the way you teed this up is, you know, what is Francis's impact going to be in the next papal election? Well, the primary impact any pope ever has on a papal election is that he appoints the electoral college, mm -hmm. right? Um, by now, Pope Francis has, has appointed a little over 60%. Yes, uh, 67, the, I think. 67 of the voting age cardinals. Presumably, uh, if the papacy goes on another five to ten years, uh, it will be well over two-thirds, which is the number you need to elect a pope. Uh, and so I, I think, number one, it, it would be unreasonable to expect that a college of cardinals largely appointed by Francis will elect anyone who would be clearly seen as a repudiation of the Francis legacy. Mm -hmm. This is the reason I think a couple of your picks are a little, frankly, out there. But, um, <laughs> but uh, more than that, uh, I think, and that's true all the time, okay? Uh, you could, I could have said that about any papal election. Um, I think the unique dynamic this time is the kinds of people Francis has been appointing mm. because uh, Francis is not just globalizing in the sense that Ross described, uh, that is, you know, including more Latin Americans, including more Asians, mm -hmm. uh, including more uh, Africans. Um, but it's also where in those regions he is finding his cardinals. He is bypassing traditional centers of power. Uh, and lifting up people who come from places uh, that, frankly, most of us have never heard of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we now have a cardinal from the island of Tongo, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have a cardinal from Haiti who is not even from one of the two principal seas uh, in Haiti. Uh, and on and on. Um, in, uh, in other words, there is always an X factor in every conclave that you can probably start. If there are going to be, say, 120 cardinals voting in a conclave, you can start, usually with at least half of those guys, you feel you've got a pretty solid read on, you know where they're coming from, you can guess mm -hmm. who they would be willing to support, who would be outside their comfort zone, uh, and then you have to worry about the other half. This time, I think it's gonna be more like, we'll have that sense about it, maybe a third uh, of the college. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other two thirds uh, are going to be wild cards. Um, and I think that makes the business of trying to handicap this ne next papal election probably more complicated than it has ever been in at least the contemporary history of the papacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Professor De Matei, your thoughts on the impact of Pope Francis's pontificate on the yes, conclave? I, um, I think that the impact uh, of, uh, of the next pontificate uh, will be perhaps more important of that the direct impact on the conclave. Um, of course, every uh, pontificate has a relationship with the previous pontificate, uh, whether uh, if it is in a continuity or in a discontinuity with it. The pontificate of uh, John uh, the 23rd, uh, for, for example, w was in clear discontinuity or for um, using your words, uh, a, repudiation, uh, a repudiation of the legacy of, of the pontificate of Pius XII. Uh, and uh, uh, on the contrary, the, the pontificate of, po of Paul VI was in the same line as that of uh, uh, John XXIII. But the real problem today does not seem to me uh, to be the relationship uh, with uh, between a, a pontificate uh, and another, 
but uh, the uh, relationship of the next Pope with uh, Vatican II. Mm. Um, because all the Pope, all the Popes have uh, succeeded uh, one another since uh, uh, 1965, uh, have referred to Vatican II positively, uh, albeit with, uh, of course, uh, some differences. But it seems to me that a strong historical uh, revision, uh, review of uh, Vatican II is underway, uh, as is evident, for example, from the uh, recent interventions of uh, Archbishop Vigano or Bishop Schneider, who don't, uh, don't come from uh, traditionalism, but who have uh, honestly faced a theological and a cultural uh, debate that seems necessary to me. Uh, so the relationship with the Vatican II, uh, I believe that will be a key point in the next pontificate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, now let's, let's um, widen out our discussion a bit and look at conclaves more generally. Professor De Mate, I think that um, when often when Catholics think about a conclave, they imagine a group of very pious cardinals going into the Sistine Chapel, um, very prayerfully asking the Holy Spirit for guidance as they vote. Um, but what do we, what does history tell us about, yes, about conclaves? Uh, I think that uh, there is a tendency uh, among Catholics to believe that uh, in a conclave the election is uh, exclusive or almost exclusive work of the uh, Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. determined by the Holy Spirit. In uh, reality, there is an assistance of the Holy Spirit, but uh, this uh, doesn't take uh, away the freedom of uh, the papal electors. So the cardinals are only assisted, mm -hmm. but uh, they are free to make mistakes. And uh, I think that no theologian, but also no Catholic, uh, could claim, for example, that uh, the cardinals who elected uh, the immoral popes of the Renaissance uh, were enlightened by the Holy Spirit. So it may happen that uh, the cardinals uh, gathered in a conclave reject the influence of the Holy Spirit. Because man is always free in uh, history, even if he is a, a cardinal in uh, a conclave. And of course, uh, this does not mean that uh, God is defeated by man or the devil, because uh, God can allow the cardinals to elect a bad pope, but if it happens, it is because uh, God is capable of uh, drawing uh, good from evil. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, uh, for me, uh, God is always a winner, All God always triumphs in uh, history and uh, in eternity. Mm -hmm. Let me pick up on something uh, you said. I think also for our viewers who are watching, I think a lot of Catholics, uh, when they think about a papal election or the Pope, they, they believe, um, and then probably the intention is very good, they believe that the Pope is hand-picked mm -hmm. by the Holy Spirit. Um, but what do, ca what do we really believe as Catholics, or what do we believe as Catholics about that? Yes, uh, I think that, uh, of course, uh, the Pope is always assisted uh, by the uh, Holy Spirit, not only um, during the election, but also during all the, his pontificate. But God leaves him free to correspond or not to correspond to his assistance, uh, just as each of us can correspond or not uh, correspond to the divine uh, grace. And so we cannot attribute to um, the Holy Spirit uh, the many faults uh, of popes and uh, men of church uh, throughout uh, history. Uh, uh, and the distinction between uh, the church, who is uh, always uh, uh, pure and immaculate, immune uh, from uh, uh, sins and errors, and the man of the church is fundamental because the man of the church can make uh, errors uh, and uh, can be sinners. So um, those who infallibilize every act of the Pope, in my view, uh, do a, a grave wrong to the church. John, thoughts? Uh, well, my first thought is, I don't know what I'm doing here. In the, in the last, like, five <laughs> minutes, this guy has used the words eschatological and infallibilized. <laughs> We're taking advantage of I his... I don't even know what they mean. We're taking advantage of, of his expertise, John. <laughs> um, so, so let me try to lower the tone a bit. Um, 
you know, I, for, fundamentally, I think uh, everything Professor Damite just said is absolutely right. Um, I mean, you don't want theological insight from me, but um, the principle here would be that Thomistic principle that grace builds on nature, it doesn't cancel it out. So the fact that there is a divine element uh, in the process of the selection of the Pope doesn't eliminate the need for good human judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I mean, you quote this in the book, Edward, of course. Uh, I've quoted it many times. Uh, in one of then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger's interviews with the German journalist Peter Seewald, one of those book length interviews he did before mm -hmm. his election as Pope, mm -hmm. Seewald mm -hmm. once asked him, How should we understand the role of the Holy Spirit in a conclave? Uh, and what Ratzinger said is, well, it, clearly we should not understand it to mean that the Holy Spirit picks the Pope. Uh, in fact, uh, probably the role, the role of the Holy Spirit is simply to make sure that we don't bring things to a complete ruin. Uh, and he said the proof of that is there are obviously too many Popes the Holy Spirit would not have picked. Right? Uh, and I think that's the way we have to understand it. And to circle back to where we began. Look, um, I, you know, I, I have, over the course of more than 20 years in this business, I have probably spoken to four dozen, five dozen cardinals who participated in one or two conclaves. Um, and all of them have told me uh, that while they did enter the Sistine Chapel in a deeply prayerful spirit, uh, and they were genuinely trying to be open to the movements of the spirit mm -hmm. in their mind and their heart, they had also done their homework. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I talked to one cardinal who had printed out everything he could find about about 20 guys he thought were reasonable shots to yes. be elected. He had big manila folders and stacked them in his suitcase and carried that with him on the plane. And that's what he read, you know, on his flight from his hometown to Rome. Uh, and so, look, <coughs> I think the dynamics are these. I think <coughs> from a Catholic point of view, we have to believe that the, the spirit is active in a conclave. We have to believe there is also a grace of office for whoever emerges from that conclave as the Pope. Uh, and that deserves a kind of benefit of the doubt, but that does not eliminate from us, and certainly not from the Cardinals, the responsibility to do the heavy lifting mm -hmm. of making sure that the Holy Spirit does not catch them unaware. Mm -hmm. Ross, uh, your thoughts on Professor Demetrius and John's John's perspectives? I mean, I at one disagrees with Joseph Ratzinger at one's peril, but I think it is important to raise the possibility that the Holy Spirit could pick popes who are, in hindsight, seen as bad or dangerous or something else for some, you know for some more cosmic purpose or, you know, that it might be possible to have a pope elected in order to chastise the church in mm -hmm. some sense. Um, that's, that's just, I just want to throw that out there as mm -hmm. sort of a, 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 wild, a wild possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, I obviously agree with the point about the necessity of approaching the election as, you know, something that, something that you treat seriously in human as, weather, as well as divine terms, which certainly means doing your homework and it certainly means recognizing that some form of politics plays a role. Obviously, there are all kinds of official rules that forbid certain kinds of politicking around a conclave. Um, but I also think that, you know, this may be especially for conservative Catholics in the current era where there's all this talk about the idea that, you know, the St. Galen Mafia, this group of more progressive cardinals sort of conspired to try and block the election of Benedict and to further the election of Francis. That kind, of, that kind of politicking has always been part of papal elections, and it hasn't always come from cardinals. There have been times when secular rulers have um, effectively vetoed, uh, vetoed potential candidates for the, th for the throne of Peter. So I, I think it's important to just to recognize the, the inevitability of politics. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as an extension of that, if you're in a factional dispute in the church, if you're in some sort of conflict over the future direction of the church, and you feel that your opponents are out politicking you, sometimes the answer is to do better at church politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> let me pick up on that. Professor uh, Demetri. Uh, okay. to give an example. Every husband or wife uh, receives a specific grace uh, with the marriage, but uh, not every a uh, husband and a wife is a good husband and a good wife. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to correspond to God's grace and uh, we have the freedom to do no. so or not. So, 
Yes. So, so you receive the gr grace, uh, but you have to correspond to, to this grace. And the responsibility is uh, uh, more grave if you have a, a high responsibility. Yes, yes. I want to pick up on something actually that Ross mentioned, and that's um, we heard stories that in the 2005 conclave and perhaps also in the 2013 conclave that the Sangalan group uh, may have been campaigning and, and maneuvering. Um, I wanted to ask you, Professor Dimite, um, to what extent or not is campaigning for a particular uh, cardinal legitimate or not legitimate in the conclaves? Uh, uh, according to the uh, Constitution, uh, university, university Dominici Regis of uh, um, John Paul II of 1996, mm -hmm. uh, the a crime, for example, of a simony, the, the boat, uh, um, where uh, boat or, or the pontificator, if this crime were perpetrated uh, in the election of the Roman pontiff, those who are guilty um, incur automatically in excommunication, excommunication late sentencia, and uh, yet, uh, what is important, the election is still considered valid. Mm. So this uh, rule is very important, uh, in my view, because on the, on the one hand, uh, it contemplates uh, the possibility of, the, uh, of a simoniac uh, election, uh, despite the Holy Spirit uh, assistance. But on the other hand, the Pope strikes uh, with excommunication those who are guilty or accomplices in this uh, simoniac uh, election. But uh, this uh, penalty doesn't strike uh, who is elect, mm. who is elected. I mean, mm -hmm. the, 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 the So the election and, is still and valid. And the same, the same constitution uh, at the Articles uh, 80, 81 uh, prohibits uh, uh, under pain of excommunication um, all uh, the authorities, uh, secular groups or individuals uh, who I interfere in the, in the election uh, of the Pope and uh, um, there is the condemnation uh, under pain of excommunication of all four, but it considers valid. No substantial change has been made from Benedict XVI. Uh, and in the book. Restore that. We want chip is not <laughs> about anything well, anyone wants to want it. Then give us a list of qualities. Problem is, uh, the College of Cardinals is not now and never has been composed exclusively of perfect human beings. Um, so inevitably, you have to pick and choose. Um, I, I think the most important, you know, this is another thing we could talk about. I think another novelty of this papal election is that I think it's probably going to be the first one in which a lot of conventional criteria that used to help cardinals sort through various possibilities uh, aren't going to matter anymore. Uh, I don't think geography matters anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it matters whether the next pope is a European or a North American or an African or an Asian. I think we are in a post-geographic era, which is a product first of globalization and secondly of the fact um, that John Paul shattered the uh, Italian monopoly in the papacy, uh, and then Francis uh, shattered the Western monopoly in the papacy. Today, it could really be anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, another issue is age. You know, we used to go through all these gymnastics of, well, what's the right age profile? You know, you don't want the guy to be too old because he's going to die too soon. You don't want to be young because you're going to be stuck with him forever. Uh, it, you know, well, the last two popes have been elected at the ages of 76 and 78, mm -hmm. uh, and one went eight full years and then chose to step off the stage. Of course, we don't know how long, uh, you know, uh, Francis is going to go. Uh, I just think those issues don't matter anymore. Um, I, I think we are at a point now, quite honestly, in which perhaps for the first time ever, cardinals can simply <coughs> ask themselves one critical question. What is the best card we have in the deck right now? Mm -hmm. Who is the smartest, most compassionate, holiest, most competent guy, regardless yeah. of how old he is, regardless of where he comes from, mm -hmm. <coughs> and in some ways, regardless of his politics? Mm -hmm. I think, by the way, that's what happened in the conclave in 2005. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think going into that conclave, Dr. John Paul, there was a lot of momentum then for a pope from the developing world and so on. 
I think the Cardinals just looked around and said, best card we have to play is Joseph Ratzer. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter that he was German and didn't matter that he was old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Go. Ross, I think. Seems like no, you were choking back a reaction. <laughs> No, I was just wondering, we, we talk, you talk, talked about orthodoxy earlier. How much do you think, John, orthodoxy <coughs> or heterodoxy is going to come into this in the next conclave? Well, I mean, I, I think it is fair to say that when cardinals elect the next pope, they will want to elect someone who is orthodox. Or at least uh, perceived to be orthodox. Or well, <coughs> Edward, as you well know, uh, different people in the church have slightly different, different standards ideas. for what That's counts true. as orthodox. I mean, orthodoxy is one of those words like hope. Everyone's for it. I mean, the question is, how do you define it? Right. Right. Uh, I think there probably would be disagreements in this body of cardinals about precisely where the limits of orthodoxy yeah, have to be sure. set. But my point is, my read is, a solid two-thirds of these guys might look at a particular candidate and say, you know, I don't agree with him on all of the issues. Mm -hmm. But that's a pope. Yes. He's smart. He's competent. He's <coughs> He cares. He has a big heart. And I, I think some of these other things will be second. Hmm. Ross, I think we have Ross back. Ross, um, what do you think that the Cardinals should be looking for the next Pope? And, uh, and did any of the um, 19 candidates in the, in the book stand out to you? I mean, I think that there is, there, there's a challenge where I think the goal of the Cardinals should be to find someone who embodies what you might call dynamic orthodoxy, um, which, which is to say what I think at his best Pope John Paul II was able to embody, a Catholicism that simultaneously doesn't leave people in serious doubt about what the church is teaching and what it believes, but also seems to be engaged with where late modernity is going, engaged with where the developing world is going, and not just sort of building a bunker around the church. Um, so that's, but, but again, that description falls into John's category of, you know, wouldn't it be nice to, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice to have the perfect saintly, dynamic, intellectual, globetrotting figure? And I think it's, it's hard to identify a sort of singular figure who fits that bill. Um, and I mean, my, my perspective, we haven't really talked about particular candidates in, in the candidates, the candidates in the book, um, I mean, I think, again, the, the sort of conventional view would be that there is sort of, there's sort of an institutional candidate who would be someone like Cardinal Perelin, who would represent sort of continuity with Francis, but perhaps a more institutionalist bent. Mm -hmm. There's a vision that would favor someone like Cardinal Tagle of the Philippines, who would seem to represent sort of the furthering of the Francis pastoral revolution um, that sort of tests the boundaries of orthodoxy, you might say, in mm -hmm. pursuit of pastoral goals. Um, and then in theory, there should then also be a conservative candidate. And I guess I'm curious what the other panelists think, because I think I share some of John's doubts about the, uh, I guess, papabilite, if you will, of the most prominent conservative figures um, in the book, whether it's uh, a Cardinal Raymond Burke, um, uh, you know, or a Cardinal Robert Seurat. Um, I'm not sure who the sort of the, the, the candidate for cardinals who, who are worried that the church has not sort of been sort of orthodox enough in certain ways under Francis and want a kind of dynamic figure, I'm not sure who that candidate would be mm -hmm. um, for, just from reading the book. So I'm curious what others think. Mm -hmm. um, Professor DeMatte, your thoughts on what the, what the cardinal electors should be looking for in the next conclave? I think that uh, John Allen is right when uh, he says that the papacy today is an impossible uh, job. But uh, I think also that we have to add that uh, it is this is true uh, without uh, the help of the divine uh, grace, because all is possible with mm -hmm. the support of the divine grace, the, the support of the divine assistance of the Holy Spirit. So I believe in, in the Holy Spirit. And for this, I think that the cardinals should choose a pope who um, has not to be uh, political or worldly, uh, but authentically religious or more precisely uh, holy, a holy pope. So he would like a pope uh, uh, like St. Pius X, uh, 
a Saint Pius the Fifth, a Saint Gregory the Seventh, uh, or the Saint, um, Saint Gregory the, the, the Fifth, because these are perennial models, not not a historical pontificate, but perennial uh, models. So a pope who uh, would first of all uh, uh, confront the crisis within the church and then establish uh, himself uh, as a moral r reference uh, uh, reference point for what remains uh, of the Christian West in the face of the dangers uh, of uh, uh, Islam or the communist uh, China or other dangers. Uh, and perhaps uh, it would be opportune, uh, 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 as a Cardinal uh, Bran Mueller hoped, uh, that uh, the next Pope would uh, open his pontificate with a public profession of uh, faith, as um, was once used, uh, because there is, as um, Edward Pentin uh, said, a serious problem of orthodoxy today mm -hmm. uh, within the Church. Mm -hmm. And um, did you, in the book, you know, we've got 19 profiles. Were there any candidates within the book who, in whom you saw the qualities that you would see would be needed for, for the next pope? Yes, uh, I I if I had a preference, uh, I wouldn't uh, express <laughs> it, uh, uh, so as not uh, to harm my <laughs> favorite uh, candidate. <laughs> but uh, the truth is that uh, uh, it uh, doesn't uh, seem to me that any of the 19th uh, Papal can candidates have th the qualities that I would wish for uh, a new Pope. And uh, this is not uh, the first time uh, mm, uh, that uh, is, uh, uh, happened. In the conclave of May 1605, um, Saint Robert Bellarmine, who was a cardinal elector, stated that he didn't not see any candidate with the qualities necessary to be Pope. But uh, there is always uh, a surprise in the history because uh, either the election, for example, of uh, St. Pius V or mm -hmm. the St. Pius uh, X uh, were absolutely uh, not predicted. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, there is the possible intervention of the uh, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. John, your thoughts about the, the 19 profiles and was there anyone who stood out to you as a potential next pope? And also just setting aside your own preferences, uh, who do you think might be most likely to be elected? Well, you're lucky because I don't get paid to have preferences. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constitutionally disallowed from having preferences, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just try to handicap the reality as I would see it. Uh, I, I think most of the people Edward has on his list are uh, on his list are plausible candidates. Mm -hmm. um, I would agree with Ross. I think uh, Cardinal Raymond Burke, Cardinal Robert Sara. I, I personally think both of them, whether this is fair or not, would be so clearly perceived in a social media age as an almost complete repudiation of the Francis papacy. That I just I don't think that's going to happen particularly with a group of cardinals, the vast majority of whom have been named uh, by this pope. Um, uh, I think probably of the remainders, I would handicap it pretty much like Ross did. Uh, I think probably Paroline is the safe bet. Like, if, if somebody put a gun to your head right now and said you have to bet your life savings on one guy, <laughs> that would probably be the name you would want to go with. Um, I think for the, what, whatever you would call it, the continuity camp, the more progressive camp, uh, certainly Cardinal uh, Luis Antonio, or as he is known, Chito Tagle, mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, would be uh, their bet. I think Ross's question is a very good one. You know, one of the smartest bishops I know, a year ago, we we're having dinner here in Rome, and he asked me if there were a St. Gallen group of the center right today, mm -hmm. who would they be coalescing behind? Mm -hmm. Like, who would be the, the, the plausible conservative candidate mm -hmm. right now? Uh, it was a hard question to answer then. It's a hard question to answer now. I Want think. to take a stab? Uh, sure. Uh, here's what I think. I think for the more conservative bloc in this conclave, okay, goes in knowing they're not going to get uh, a Burke or a Sarah. Um, they're probably not even going to get uh, an Angelus Scola. I mean, he's probably, I mean, poor Cardinal Scola. He's, he was a viable candidate the last couple of times. Uh, I think some people may think that his moment has come and gone. 
um, but they're probably not even going to get him, right? So uh, what they're looking for is someone who may not exactly be in their camp, mm -hmm. but someone with whom, if I can use this kind of language, with whom they think they can do business, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, who at least understands where mm -hmm. they're coming from and is not going to go too far too fast. Mm -hmm. Compromise. Yeah. But meanwhile, it has to be somebody who is also acceptable to that two-thirds plus faction in the college that was appointed by Francis and doesn't want anybody who's going to be seen as just throwing that out, mm -hmm. out the window, right? Mm -hmm. Who do you come up with? Uh, well, my logic leans me to Cardinal Christoph Schoenberg uh, of Vienna, the Dominican, uh, who was once known as the doyen uh, of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, yeah. kind of the crown prince, right, uh, under Ratzinger, general editor of the Catechism. For most of his career, had a reputation as a fairly strong conservative. Um, now, during the Francis papacy, has backed the Pope at certain critical junctures. Mm. Um, that have led people to kind of, or at least some people, to redefine their impressions of Cardinal Schoenberg. But above all, the thing about Cardinal Schoenberg is that he is not an ideologue. He is a incredibly deep mind. Um, he is an original thinker. He is unpredictable. Um, and he will end up sometimes on some issues in positions that we would conventionally see as conservatives and others uh, as a progressive. Mm -hmm. That's either going to make him a man without a country or mm -hmm. the consensus favorite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of those mm -hmm. two things will mm -hmm. happen. Very good. Uh, Professor Demate. Mm -hmm. I give you an example. For, um, in the past, uh, um, two um, possible papabili, Cardinal Martini and mm -hmm. Cardinal Bertone, worked uh, uh, to become uh, popes. Uh, they worked very much. But uh, for uh, Cardinal Martini, there was uh, the, the, he, mm. he, he fallen um, mm. uh, ill, and uh, the, his uh, disease um, that uh, which uh, avoided the the election. And uh, for Cardinal Bertone, there were some scandals. And so, for example, two candidates who seemed to be very favorite, very sure in the last years, mm, were finished in uh, in a few in in a short time. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, um, nobody can be sure about uh, the, this election. I, I think that uh, the, 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 the book of the Edward Painting could be useful more than to, to define the next pope, but to define uh, the um, opposite blocks, because uh, in, the, in a conclave uh, there are uh, the leaders of uh, uh, the, the, the opposite blocs, for example, leaders of con con more conservative or more progressive. Uh, I give you an example, uh, after the pontificate of, of uh, Pius X, uh, Cardinal Mary del Val mm -hmm. was the leader of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the cardinals uh, who collected the legacy of Pius X, but uh, he had never the possibility to become Pope. Mm -hmm. and so. He, but he worked in, in, in the conclave to help other candidates to become. And so um, you, 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 have, you have seen, for example, speaking about Cardinal Burke, that he's too perceived as a conservative for becoming a pope, but he can be a, within a conclave a sure. reference point sure. for a leader of, of mm -hmm. a, a, a block. We're going to. If I can, if I can um, interrupt for a moment, we're going to need to say goodbye and thank you to Ross, who has to, he has to leave us. So thank you very much, Ross, for joining us. Um, Bye, Ross. <laughs> <Thank> Ross. <laughs> it was, it was, a, it, was a it was a pleasure. <laughs> I wish I was in Italy, but this was the next best thing. <laughs> we wish you were here too. Bye bye. Yeah, so I'm sorry, Professor Dimite, did you no, have no, anything I to add? No, no, I finished. Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to talk about something really quickly, and that's. Um, for the first time in history, we have uh, a, a Pope Emeritus. Now, if a, if a new conclave were to be held in the very near future, we, how, how do you think that his presence uh, might affect it? John? Well, I might be in a minority on this point, but I don't think it would have much effect on it at all. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a little bit of, like, Catholic craziness whenever anything happens for the first time. Uh, and we all want to spin out these, like, scenarios uh, about, you know, schisms and, and riots and, you know, confusion. 
I'm sure the first time a retired diocesan bishop hung around in a diocese while his next guy took over, people went a little bit nuts trying to figure out mm -hmm. how that was going to work. And then, you know, in a couple of weeks, they all get used to it because, you know, it's clear who's in charge. Similarly, I don't think there's a Catholic on the planet today confused about who was actually in charge uh, mm -hmm. in the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. Um, I don't think cardinals who are going into the next conclave are going to feel... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, 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 one of two extremes. Either uh, the more progressives would be worried about Benedict as a kind of behind the scenes influence and therefore try to push even harder uh, to counteract mm -hmm. uh, fears of that influence. I don't think the conservatives are going to be taking their cues from the Mater Ecclesia Monastery where Benedict is living. Um, I and uh, assuming uh, that, that the Pope Emeritus is still with us when this happens, I think he would move heaven and earth to keep a very respectful distance and silence. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the dynamics of the conclave, whether there is a Pope Emeritus or not, uh, at least with this Pope Emeritus, who is so respectful, so humble, um, so selfless, uh, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they would be fundamentally any different. Mm -hmm. Professor De Matteo, your thoughts? I agree with uh, Jonah Allen and uh, more I hope that Benedict XVI uh, will not exert any influence on uh, the new conclave because unfortunately his resignation, uh, um, uh, with his resignation he has uh, assumed a, a, a very serious responsibility for the confusion uh, the church is in, in uh, today. And so I hope that uh, the next uh, conclave will not uh, aggravate uh, the confusion, but uh, possibly put an end to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good. We're going to now take um, a couple of uh, questions from viewers. Um, the both of them come from Facebook. The first question is um, for our panel. Um, do the qualities today that make a good pope today, are they this, or the qualities that in, pa in history made for a good pope, are they the same qualities that are needed for a pope today? Edward, any thoughts? Well, I think clearly the, a new pope today has to be pretty media savvy. I would say that's something that uh, hasn't been the case. Well, it has in the last, in modern history, but mm -hmm. uh, I think even more so now, and uh, not that they should be on social media necessarily, but uh, tweeting. <laughs> tweeting, but they do need to have a God. certain... Although Pope Francis does <laughs> tweet, not necessarily Pope Francis himself, so, but he does have yes. an account. But, uh, so I think that's one key element, but um, but also, this, uh, as we were saying earlier, that the whole, glo or John was saying, the whole globalized setting now, the whole the fact that the church is so, uh, it's always been international, but it's that that's the greater emphasis now, and there mm -hmm. has to be that greater awareness of of the realities of the church in the every part of the world, mm -hmm. it can't be Eurocentric anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I think that's another element too. But, uh, but yeah, there's, a, there's a certainly, as we were saying earlier, lots of challenges that a modern mm -hmm. pope now. Is to John. Well, I mean, you know, different historical situations have beckoned different gifts from different popes, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, when the pope was also a secular ruler. Um, you know, sometimes they had to worry about ginning up an army to go fight a crusade, which is not a task uh, we're assuming uh, that contemporary popes are going to face. Um, you know, I, I think fundamentally that the basics are probably eternal, right? Uh, I mean, what you want in any leader, and, you know, Magadi, as we say here in Italy, you know, certainly in a pope, uh, you know, you want fundamentally, I would think, uh, an open, curious mind a big heart and deep holiness. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, know, you, you give the church those three things. The church is remarkably resilient. You know, um, you know, the famous line from Monsignor Knox that the ultimate proof of the divinity of the church is that any other institution run with such navis imbecility would be yeah. dead in a fortnight, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but you give the church those three things. I, I think it can it can muddle through. Uh, I would agree with Edward that I think some consciousness uh, of the dynamics of the modern media, mm -hmm. uh, without being a slave to those dynamics, mm -hmm. but a consciousness of those dynamics uh, is important. Mm -hmm. uh, I think increasingly some kind of aptitude for management uh, is important. I mean, we have seen now four consecutive popes uh, attempt to work a kind of structural reform of the inner management uh, of the Vatican. Yeah. 
And whatever else those four popes have achieved to date, they have not achieved that. Mm -hmm. um, and so some kind of basic, some reason to believe uh, that there is a kind of aptitude for that sort of thing would probably be important. But beyond that, uh, you know, I, it is so impossible. I mean, who knew when Pope Francis was elected in March uh, 2013 that he was going to be the pope to preside over the coronavirus? Yeah. And by the way, whatever else you want to say about Pope Francis's uh, you know, occasional seeming uh, well, indifference is too strong a word, but the liturgy is perhaps not highest on his to-do list all of the time. Um, you know, the liturgies he gave us during this period, and I think particularly that March 27th, Urbi at Orbi, that haunting liturgy in, in a deserted St. Peter's Square where the only sound you could hear was the falling rain, his voice, and the sirens of ambulances in the background, him flanked by Maria Salas Popolo Romani and the crucifix from San Marcello. That was magnificent. And I don't think anybody could have predicted that this pope would have that in him at that moment because none of us knew it was coming, right? So I, I would fall back on those basics. Uh, an open mind, a big heart, personal holiness, adaptability, and, and the church's capacity to muddle through, we'll see to the rest. Professor Demite, your, your thoughts? Uh, the historical context can change, of course, but uh, the, the model is uh, always the, the same because uh, every pope during the history has always first to reform uh, the church the, uh, and second fight against the internal and external enemies uh, of the church because uh, uh, the church is a militant church with uh, enemies mm -hmm. and uh, the mission of the Pope it is uh, to, to, to defend the, the Catholic people against the, the, the uh, enemies and uh, so it, it is uh, in my view a perennial uh, model uh, in my view today the uh, the ideal uh, uh, Pope would be a St. Pius V Excellent, excellent. Fascinating discussion. We're going to have to we're going to have to leave it there. But Edward, um, I wanted to offer you the possibility. Um, what were your takeaways from this evening's conversation? And was there anything you wanted to add about the book? Right. Be honest. Probably number one is never invite John Allen. <laughs> <laughs> right? And if you agree no, with all of my, my picks, yeah. that would be put him at the top of your list. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I I think it's a very interesting discussion. And thanks, obviously, for coming. But it, it's it's. Uh, I think it is going to be a very contentious, obviously, conclave coming up. And I think what you say, Professor De Matteo, about the the, the, the church being, having to be militant, I think that's going to be become more so probably uh, in the future when we have these external and internal um, threats. And I think that will have a bearing on the conclave as well. But um, but I just want to say about the book that I do hope it, it, it is of service because it is, I, I hope it wasn't too ideological, John, but I, I really tried to hope tried to make it very factual and uh, an objective, but I, I, there probably are, it does seem to be to some uh, perhaps veering to the, to the conservative the side. The point is, no matter so where you are in the compass, no matter what you think you know, yes. you will be better informed about these 19 men on yes. the basis of reading this book. And for that alone, Edward, it is a huge service. Good. And we all thank you for it. Yes. Well, thank you. I think so the same. It would be a really very useful book for, above all, for the cardinals. Yes. 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 Gather, I think, the next conference. Yeah, I can guarantee you're going to have at least 19 sales yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as this thing hits the shelves. Well, I've been saying that the, it's 19, but I expect the 20th will be the one that's picked and it's going to be <laughs> in the book. Yeah. But, uh, but no, thank you very much for coming. and. Uh, just for viewers to know that uh, the book should be available at the end of July or the beginning of August, uh, and you can pre-order it uh, on Sophia Institute Press website. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. for the book, and, and many thanks to our distinguished guests for coming to tonight's program and sharing their insights. Ross Douthat, Professor Roberto De Matei, and John Allen. Thank you all for watching. To pre-order the next Pope, the leading Cardinal candidates, Visit Sophia Press's website at www.sophiainstitute.com. That's www.sophiainstitute.com. From all of us here in Rome, we hope you enjoy the discussion. Good evening and God bless. <laughs>